History 131 students. This should be the last of my video lectures for the semester. Can't believe it. We made it to the end already. Here we are in December and gearing up for the end. So we made it to the Civil War. Uh, I had to put a couple chapters together and uh, last week. But we've reached our goal to hit uh, the Civil War, which is really a good pivotal point in this um, history of the United States. After the Civil War, quite a bit has changed. The Civil War is going to be the thing that makes these changes in the United States. Uh, but the legacy of some of the things that caused the Civil War won't go away or be eradicated completely. Um, in fact, some of them are still with us. And of course, the memory of the Civil War is very strong within our culture and our present day culture still today. So this is a huge event. Again, I might sound like a broken record. I wish I had more time because really the Civil War for a survey class like this should take a couple weeks, if not more. And we could grapple with some of these big events that happen in just a four year period. But this lecture, like the lectures before, is going to do its best, or I'm going to do my best, to hit main points um, and get you an idea so if you're interested in this big event, you might be able to take it further and look at some of these elements on your own or build on your knowledge of the Civil War uh, by doing independent study or taking other classes that really look and focus in on the Civil War. So, what I'd like to start with <coughs> is a little bit about politics. And we talked some about the sectional crisis last week um, to kind of fill in the tensions that were rising up because of the problems in the U.S., especially involving slavery. Now, the election of 1860, if you think that we went through a contentious election just recently, a month ago, well, <laughs> the election of 1860 is proof that really there's nothing new under the sun. And there's been lots of um, hard-fought, tense, um, uh, anger-inducing, if you will, uh, elections in our history. 1860 was definitely up there. Um, who's in the running here? You have a couple of Southerners um, vying for a uh, position. It's the Democrats versus the Republicans. Uh, and the issue, of course, is slavery in both of those parties and responses to slavery. Um, in a nutshell, though, Abraham Lincoln, a relative unknown politician for the Republicans, gets the nomination because he has a popular platform, platform meaning uh, his issues, the issues that he stands on for his election. Um, and his main one is no expansion of slavery into the new territories that are being taken through the idea of manifest destiny. And he gains a lot of support in the North for those ideas. Now, he's very unpopular for those ideas in the South, as you can imagine. So he's nominated for the Republican Party based on that no extension of slavery. Uh, and he wins the election of 1860. He only gets 40% of the popular vote, but we also know it's not just the popular vote, it's the Electoral College that weighs in. And he got all of the northern states, um, meaning their electoral votes, except for New Jersey. So he gets in as president. Now in the South, he's so unpopular that on Southern ballots, he isn't even listed. In other words, there's no Abraham Lincoln that you check off there. He is so disliked in um, the Southern states. Almost immediately after his election, the Southern states start to call, start to do what we call secede. They seceded from the Union. They broke away from the Union. And, decided in whatever form it would take to form their own union or their own nation or country apart. Uh, the states that did it and took the lead in this were South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Louisiana, and this all happened in early 1861 leading up to Lincoln's inauguration. The South said, no, we don't like what this man stands for. In fact, he was very hated by the South, Abraham Lincoln. And again, uh, emphasizing that he was a relative newcomer. It was the idea of no expansion of slavery into the new territories that really made him hated in the South. Now, when the Confederacy, or I'm sorry, when the South did this, they formed their own version of a nation called the Confederacy, 
or the Confederate States of America. And with that came a kind of nationalism. We talked a little bit about nationalism before, where you have symbols and images and iconography and those kinds of things to solidify your feeling of nationhood. The political things that the Confederate States of America rallied around, first and foremost, was the protection of slavery. Okay? Now, it had, sort of like Manifest Destiny, it had a religious subcontext in there too. And that was Southerners, many powerful Southern people believed that it was God's will that African Americans be slaves. Okay, it's an erroneous, in other words, wrong way of thinking, but in those days it was very popularly, popularly held belief, especially in the South, but in the North somewhat too. Okay, and the third one, or, well, we've got the protection of slavery, and the second one is sort of a fulfillment of God's will. This is all about Confederate nationalism. All right, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. And the third one is that there was a material interest subtext to this too, that if slavery ends, that all of those trappings of the South, those big plantations, that sort of rich uh, aristocratic lifestyle that they borrowed from the English and held over from the 18th century, all that would go away. That means a material interest, an interest in the things and the trappings of being wealthy Southerners, uh, and all that wealth is being created by this labor system of slavery. So the political side of the Confederates were these ideas of slavery, that it's God's will and material interests. Right? Lincoln's response to this, right away in his inaugural address, the first thing he does as a president after being sworn in is make a speech, and his speech says that all this secession by the South is illegal, legally void. He doesn't accept it. In fact, he says it's a criminal act to secede from the Union of the United States. It's against the Constitution. It's a federal crime. Okay, so this puts all eyes on federal installments. In other words, places where federal troops are stationed or there's a federal presence in the southern part of the country. The most important part of that place in that is Fort Sumter, right off of Charleston Harbor in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, Charleston is the hotbed, the, the capital, the center of the Southern Secessionist movement, the breakaway movement. So this is the kind of um, ground zero, I guess, of tension. And it escalates. Um, the Southerners, led by P.G.T. Beauregard, a general, I think he's a general. You might want to look that up. I'll probably put a fact check right up here. Um, he asks the commanding officer of Fort Sumter, a Union troop, um, uh, Major Anderson to surrender. Anderson, um, uh, Anderson refuses. That's the word I'm looking for. Anderson refuses, and Beauregard fires on Fort Sumter. This is in April of 1861, April 12, 1861. So hostilities of the Civil War have begun. The Union and the South are at war now after Fort Sumter. Now the Union forms a battle strategy, a strategy for winning this war and trying to win it quickly. And what they come up with is something called the Anaconda Plan. It involves two big elements. The first is a naval blockade, where they take their ships, their navy, and they have a considerably stronger navy than the South, and they strangle all those ports and don't allow any kind of supply and trade to happen in the southern ports. Right? The second part or element of this is deploying active ground troops to work within that encirclement of the navy and fight battles and decisively take southern key cities and strategic places and destroy any opposition or army forces that the Confederate can mount against them. Thus, the Anaconda plan is to squeeze the South like a snake. Right? So also, in this plan, it's being called more and more for the use of former slaves to fight on behalf of the Union. Now, this is still 
for the most part, a racist nation, both north and south. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of pushback against that idea of having former slaves, escaped slaves, slaves that have come up to the north to take up arms. So it's a gradual process and the, sol and the slaves are um, initially taken as contrabands of war, like war contraband, like you would capture a horse or a cannon or something like that. So they were kept in specific areas and they were still ill-treated, they were um, subjected to disease and things like that, poor nutrition. So it was not going well for those freed slaves, even after they come over to the Union side and hope for immediate emancipation and, in a, and be allowed to fight for their own freedom for the Union. Okay, so we've set the stage kind of politically and how the war started. Now, very quickly, I'd like to run through some key battles of the Civil War. Now, the dates of the Civil War, starting in 1861, ending in 1865. So, I'm skipping. There's plenty of battles. Um, I'm in Virginia right now, the Valley of Virginia, so you go just a, a few miles and there's a battlefield this way. Over here, there was a skirmish and there'll be a historical marker that way. So, the whole part of this country is really affected by this big war. But the key battles I'd like to go through start with Bull Run. This is also known as the Battle of Manassas, and this is in July of 1861. It's the first major battle of the Civil War after Sumter, and it proved that this would be a long and costly war. People didn't know what the war would look like. The Union was hoping for a decisive victory to show the South, you don't mess with us, and it didn't happen that way. The South had less forces and um, maybe less ability to launch a war, but they had very smart commanders and in a lot of these battles they had home field advantage. So uh, the South looked like they, they weren't going to be an easily defeated force at all. So Bull Run convinces um, both sides that this is going to be a hard fought struggle. The next one is really getting on to a year later. After Bull Run, it was realized that this is going to be hard, there's going to be lots of loss, lives lost, and strategy had to be um, replanned. So we don't get a, another major battle, at least on this list, until Shiloh in Tennessee in April of 62. Now this really showed the writing on the wall about how deadly this was going to be. This was the deadliest battle in U.S. history up to that point. Now there's been deadlier since, but this really woke, awoke people to how deadly this was going to be. There were 23,000 casualties at Shiloh over a two-day period, April 6th and 7th, 1862. And uh, casualties meaning wounded and dead, with some missing in there too. So we have to assume that maybe the missing died but no, were never found. Okay, then there's, there's, there's some deserters too. So 23,000 casualties, that's huge in those days. The next one, the next big battle, battle to take note of, is Antietam, uh, September 17th, 1862. This is the deadliest single day battle. Shiloh took place over two days. Antietam was one, uh, one day. In that battle, over 22,000 wounded are dead. So almost as many as Shiloh over the two day period. The thing about Antietam, Antietam which is in Maryland, um, September 17th, 1862, was that it really brought home how deadly this was, if Shiloh didn't already. But the Union victory prompted Lincoln to use the Union victory at Antietam as a catalyst to emancipate, emancipate the slaves. And he did that with the issue of the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves in the South. All right now, what did the South say about that? No way, we're still at war, we're the Confederate States of America, and we make our own laws. But uh, Lincoln, seeing that Union victory, said, okay, if we're winning this thing. Of course, nobody knew if they were gonna win at that point, but Lincoln said, we're winning this thing, and uh, therefore, slaves are freed in the South. The Union is preserved, and this is the law now. All right, from that point on, Antietam and the Emancipation Proclamation the war had been about preserving the Union and keeping the South as part of the United States. Now it's about emancipation and Lincoln 
uh, use this to further catalyze uh, his troops and, and motivate them. But the South isn't done fighting, and they fight hard. They keep on fighting. Lee, uh, General Robert E. Lee, uh, the general for the Northern Army of Virginia, invades the North into Pennsylvania in the summer of 1863. And at the Battle of Gettysburg, Lee is defeated over three hard-fought days, July 1st through 3rd, 1863. In that three-day period, there are 51,000 casualties. Lee has to leave the field of battle, which in those days meant that you more or less lost. Um, so Gettysburg is a huge win for the Union, although there's lots of casualties on both sides. So it's, uh, the, the Union has to deal with losing lots and lots of men. Their army, by the way, I should have said this earlier, is called the Army of the Potomac. All right, so Lee is the North Army of Northern Virginia. The Union Army is the Army of the Potomac. The day after Gettysburg's final day, July 4th, 1863, the Union have another huge victory in their Western theater of war out there around the Missouri and the Mississippi River at Vicksburg in Mississippi. Vicksburg was a siege as soon as Union gets, the Union gets the town of Vicksburg, they're able to control um, commerce up the river, and it's a big win. So Gettysburg and Vicksburg happen virtually at the same time, and the Union wins the siege of Vicksburg. Now, going into 1864, it is a hard year for everyone. Lots of disease, hardship, lots of women are becoming widows. At the same time, they're joining the war effort, either at home and creating um, things that will give support to the troops and send to the troops, or they're receiving all of these wounded troops coming back uh, to their towns and their hometowns with the problems of war, of disease, of amputated limbs, of, um, at this time we call it PTSD. Uh, I don't even know if they had a, a term for it back then. Battle fatigue, shell shock, what have you. So women were very affected by the Civil War, and there's a, a whole um, sub-genre, I guess, of the Civil War historical study that has to do with the role of women here. Women come into their own, a little bit like Republican motherhood, but this is in a way a lot more terrible and tragic. Um, not to say that the Revolutionary War didn't have its awful tragedies, but this is so widespread that women are really having to adapt. Southern women um, are having to lose men in droves, maybe their husband and their sons, all of them. And then they're having to figure out how to survive in, um, in, a, in a region that is decimated by war and eventually is going to lose the war. So all of these have to be in, in, taken into effect. 1864 was a period of deprivation for many Americans at that time. All right, so eventually the Union, through um, kind of superior forces, I'd say, in numbers more than anything, and their ability to use their industry to create better and more armament, um, they wear the South down by 1865. And Robert E. Lee has to surrender. He does that in Virginia at Appomattox Courthouse. I think it's about 70 to maybe 100 miles away from Rockingham County. It's an interesting place to visit. Uh, so it's a good day trip if you ever want to do that. Um, he is, surrenders April 9th, 1865, almost four years to the day of the battle at Fort Sumter. So some things to take away from the Civil War. It's the bloodiest war in the nation's history, partly, in fact, partly because um, it's Americans fighting Americans. The current estimate is 750,000 dead during the period of the Civil War. It eradicated slavery, which is a good result of the Civil War, but some lingering problems uh, remained on. One of them was bitterness and racism in the South. Um, the South still had their land, but they had their labor system, as wrong as it was, wiped out. So they had to deal with that problem and how to relate to it. 
for um, African Americans, they now had freedom, but they had no land and often very little opportunity for work. Um, they did have, their, have freedoms restored to them. Their uh, marriage was protected uh, and they could um, seek employment if they wanted to outside for wages, but they still dealt with these really difficult challenges that would bring them into the last half of the 19th century. All right. So that there I'm ending up with the Civil War lecture. There's still plenty to say, I'm sure, but I wanted to keep this relatively brief. I just wanted to also say, getting away from the topic of the Civil War, I want everybody to have a safe and happy holiday season. Um, this hasn't been the most ideal way to teach, but I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from students this semester from Rockingham Community College. I started here three semesters ago, I think it was. Yeah, and I've been so encouraged by uh, Rockingham Community College um, itself and, and the students there. So have a safe um, holiday season, and I hope to hear from some of you in the spring.